Good morning. Thank you, Linda, for the flattering introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here. And I, I have yet to absorb the full import of this do good campus. I'm happy to be here. Um, so, uh, I'm going to tell you a bit about my own work in uh, robotics and particularly robotics aimed that try to help people cover up the neurologic injury. And uh, my main interest has been in uh, recovery after stroke. The reason for that is partly because it's the big, it's, it's the big one. It's the leading cause of neurologic disability in the U.S. The leading cause of worldwide. It's a growing challenge due to Asian demographics. And although there are lots of different ways that you can help people recover after an injury, they include uh, pharmacological approaches, uh, molecular approaches. In fact, if you look at the use of pharmacology to help people recover after stroke, it's tough. The last count I saw was that there had been 1,200 um, molecular agents tested for helping recovery. This is a neuro, neuro recovery process. And so far, zero have gotten through the uh, phase three trials with that from the um, FDA. So that's a hard problem. My focus has been on robotics and, and related technologies, partly because I think it's a little bit easier, and partly because it addresses what the uh, patients care about. So, stroke, for example, stroke is basically a problem at the cellular level. Something, some of the cells are hit in your brain, and they'll start with oxygen, and they don't work so well anymore, and they die. It's a molecular, cellular problem. But what you care about are the, the physical disabilities that that result from. So it's the symptoms that actually matter. And I know we shouldn't be treating the symptoms, we should be treating the cause, but people would like to be able to move better and talk better and so on. And so the reason to look at robotics is because it's essentially a movement tool. It gives you the ability to put in lots of repetitions, make the, the uh, treatment patient responsive and so forth. The stroke occurs when the flow of blood to the brain is interrupted, often by a blood clot. And every year, about 600,000 Americans suffer a stroke. About 430,000 survive. Our focus is on a robot which is helping survivors get control of their bodies again. Here's ABC's John McKenzie. Once you've survived a stroke, the next challenge is to recover from paralysis, to regain control of a leg, an arm, a hand. Would you try to move with me? Like many patients, 65-year-old Donald Milbury was given 10 months of rehabilitation with a therapist. And like many patients, it was not enough. I had very little uh, mobility in my left arm. Researchers at Massachusetts Institute of Technology thought a newly developed robotic arm could help. But adds hope to most people who think that they have done all that they can. The technology is sophisticated. The concept Remarkably simple. Retraining the brain to control the muscles. When the target changes color, you, the patient, is supposed to move a little, you know, not to coincide with the red one. And if I don't get to that dot, the robot's going to pull me there. That's right. And if you do something in the wrong direction, it pulls me back. So it nudges you back in the direction you should be going. So it's the same movement over and over again. It's so repetitive that a one on one interaction with a therapist over a course of one hour would never yield 700 movements of a person's arm. Go one more time around that. Initial studies show that adding a robot to a rehabilitation program can double the mobility in a patient's arm. I have a lot more use of it now. I can open a bottle cap and uh, carry things in my hand that I couldn't carry before. As Karen Levine discovered, using the robot even eight years after a stroke can still help. I can actually raise my arm up and stretch my arm out, and I was never able to do that before. Researchers say the robots, now used at several rehabilitation centers in the Northeast, could eventually be made simply and cheaply enough that patients could take them home. If they take the machine home, they can continue to do as much of it as they can see fit. And not just on the arms. Researchers are now working on separate robots for the wrist and fingers, foot and hip. Allowing more stroke patients a fuller, faster recovery. John McKenzie, ABC News, Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I thought it was a better idea to have Peter Jennings explain this than me, and it gives you some sense of what the technology is. One thing I wanted to point this is a very old video, of course. 
One thing I want to point out is look at the estimated annual incidence that he cites, which is 600,000. 2010, the number's up to 800,000. And that's actually getting progressively worse. These are statistics for the demographic, age demographics in the U.S. from 1960 projected out to 2060. And there's a whole lot more old people around. And although many of the old people are maintaining health, Stroke is primarily a, a, a disease of age, a disorder of age. So we have a huge bolus of people showing up who will have problems on stroke, will need some sort of treatment. And we don't have a similarly uh, a similar increase in the number of people available to help them uh, recover. So that's why I think robotics technology makes sense here. And of course, that was all the work that I showed you. Uh, but you need to, it, it's always important to check does the technology actually work? Well, uh, what we've looked at this, you can go check the, the literature and the, 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 this technology, although it's limited, it is effective. The benefits are maintained for up to three years. It can work for people with uh, chronic, in the chronic phase of recovery after stroke rather than just in the sub acute phase. It's been recommended by the American Heart Association in 2010, again in 2015. Every five years they've come out with their guidelines. The US Veterans Administration recommended it. And one of the big surprises was that based on the, on the VA studies, the four study of four clinical centers of the VA, they found that not only was it better than usual care, it was actually cheaper. And you said, how could that be? Well, because the machine was expensive. Well, the reason it was, it was better is because the patients who received the robotic therapy made less use of all the additional services that the VA system provides than the patients who received usual care. If you had the, the total cost up, the robotics turned out to be cheaper. And of course, the technology hasn't stood still. This is the current generation of the technology. And of course, this is, uh, this is from the company that I um, have some equity in, so be aware of it. There's lots of other technology out there. So it sounds great, right? But <laughs> it's, it's never that simple. So I'm going to talk about this is the, this is the LEAF study. It's a locomotive experience of flight post stroke. This is the paper that showed up in 2011. And this is an assessment of an approach to locomotion. This is body weight supported treadmill training. And the idea that you can see it there is you use a parachute harness or something like that to unweight the subject. The subject is on a treadmill so that they can uh, experience walking. And either two or three therapists are used to help them with their leg motions. And in this particular study, they did a session of treatment on the, on the, on the treadmill, immediately followed by other therapists where you see the and it means that, that you have a uh, patient who's assisted with a uh, single walking program. And there's the details of the study are there on the slide, and I'm going to them. Uh, the idea is to see how, how effective is um, what is the treadmill training. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with clinical trials, one of the things you have to do is you really have to care for people in the control group, right? Because in this case, the control group was a home exercise based in, in intervention. Oh, by the way, the control group was, uh, uh, was published five, uh, uh, four years prior to the, uh, to, the, to the study itself. So you kind of have to dig in the literature. But the key thing about this control group, it was deliberately designed to have little or no effect on the primary outcome, which is gait speed. But it was supposed to be sufficiently intensive and credible that patients that were in therapy have similar cardiovascular loading and so forth. So it was a series of um, essentially strengthening and um, related exercises. So that's what we're comparing with. Locomotor experience uh, on a treadmill with follow-up on the ground versus non-locomotive experience in the home. And what you find is the, the outcome is good news and bad news. Good news is that about over half of all participants improved functional walking ability a year post-stroke. That's good. That was not bad. Bad news is that there was no difference between the study groups. So the bodyweight supported treadmill training with technology and two and maybe three therapists with all around follow-up was no better than an exercise program in the home that was designed to have no effect on gain speed. So this is a little, uh, shall we say, <laughs> there's a bit of a loose in the color map of this. So what do we need next? It's very tempting. I'm a mechanical engineer and we make stuff and I really enjoy technology. So the center said, oh, well, we need better designs. And of course we do. But I don't think that's the key thing that we need. What we really need to, is to understand, quantitatively understand, 
unimpaired motor control, and even more difficult, understand how motor control is recovered as a neurological injury. So in my view, what we need is the science as well as the engineering. Okay, so how, how hard can that be? Well, let's take a look. So this is, uh, this, this video shows a robot sucker. And it's a little bit old, it's not that old, it's a few years back. I want you to compare robot soccer, which by the way is very, it's great stuff, it motivates students like crazy, you learn a lot by doing it, but compare robot soccer with human soccer. No context, right? Now we realize that if you look at a typical robot, it's vastly simpler than a human. Human has 200 degrees of freedom, 600 plus muscles. We have actuators that are, are low bandwidth, about maybe 3 hertz, 4 hertz maximum. Uh, you look at feedback loop delays. Uh, the typical loop delay, if you go transcortical, is 100 to 100 milliseconds or better. We have communication neurons at best do about 100 meters per second communication. Electrons, something like about 10 meters per second. So humans are slow, believably slow. And yet we've dexterous and agile. And more dexterous and agile than most robots you've seen. In fact, I'd even say any robot you've seen. That's certainly true for dexterity. Agility, machines are different. So how's this possible? Well, it gets even worse when you think of the fact that if you look at the complexity issue, you've got a major problem. So it's fairly clear that delays and slow responses may impair reactive feedback-based control. I and mean, it's not that you don't use feedback, but it implies that you have to do more of a predictive control. And that's been the direction that robotics has been heading. Model predictive control is now the way that people are operating. The idea here is that you take a, you have a model of the system, you have, you have an estimate of the state, you do a finite look at optical control, and you keep repeating that. And as you launch that optical control, you make more observations, update the state, and go through the cycle. And, and, and it works. The technology originally was developed in the chemical processing industry, where the industry where the processes are slow enough that you can make out. As computers have gotten faster, we've been able to apply to things like robots, where the time scales are. But the thing to realize is that this prediction requires some sort of an internal model. Okay? That, that, that the, the thing that's doing the control has to have a model of the thing it's controlling. And there's uh, some evidence, it's not completely uh, clear, but there's some evidence that there's an internal model that involves at least the cerebellum in the, the, uh, the world system. But there's a problem here, and that is if you think about optimizing the model, you are profoundly vulnerable to Richard Bellman's curse of dimensionality. So the problem of the optimization goes up exponentially with the number of degrees of freedom, that's hard enough, and the number of time steps that you get. So this is a really hard problem. So how much complexity can humans manage? Take a look at this. This is April Joy. This is a video shamelessly stolen from the internet. This young lady is able to play Jenga with the whip. She may have actually hit the target of this thing from what, 2016 now? Right? This is fun. I can tell you that I can either run forever, but uh, I'm going to move on. She's pretty good at that. So let's think about this, this uh, video. This is Adam Winrich, another self styled webmaster. He's able to hit a bottle cap off of a bottle, or in this case, this is a card holding a. Uh, so, pretty good. And. Okay. <coughs> So I forget this young lady's name. This is, this is a rhythm gymnast. My point here is that look, a, a whip is a flexible, non isotropic, non uniform uh, material interacting with a compressible gas. And if you crack the whip, it goes up to supersonic regime. The flexible rhythm, uh, just look at the complexity of the object. If you were to put together an engineering style model of this, it's going to be partial differential equations. You don't have a prayer of solving that in real time, never mind optimizing through its parameters. So, you know, is there an alternative? Well, of course, I didn't ask the question, I wouldn't think I had an answer. But, so the idea here is that I think what's going on is, and this is work that I've developed with a colleague, Dr. Mustermann that what you have are primitive dynamic behaviors that provide a workaround. So the idea here is that the dynamic primitives are actually nonlinear dynamic attractors. Things like, for example, a point attractor is just even every time standing up, so it's something that's something, something, something attracted to. Another classic one is the rhythmic behavior. Rhythmic behavior implies a little something. 
But you can get other, uh, uh, the, but the set of attractors is not limited to that. You can have a trajectory be an attractor, you can have the mechanical impedance be an attractor, and so on. So, the question is, well, how would that help? So the idea here is that we've got a sort of, it's, it's a, you can minimize the requirement for separate control without compromising high performance. So each of the primitives itself is a highly dynamic behavior, but you can launch it, and it's not so much fire and forget as fire and monitor. So you can, you can issue one of these dynamic primitives, keep track of what's going on, and then you don't have to continuously intervene, but you can if you can need to later on. And I think this makes sense. That you, I, I presume that the people in the room have played sports of various kinds, and you know that if you think about what you're doing, you're not going to do so well, right? If you think if the baseball hitter is thinking about his hit, you're not going to do a hit. It's not going to happen. You basically you have to launch these behaviors. Okay, any evidence to support this idea? Well, of course, the idea developed out of the work that we did done on neural recovery. This, this, these are slides taken from uh, some of the earlier studies we did on subacute stroke patients using being, uh, getting therapy from really prototypes of our robots. And in this study, uh, every so often we would have the machine stop giving therapy and just ask the patients to uh, make a movement. And in this, in this case, the robot was designed to be highly back drivable. So it's essentially becomes a, a, a motion reporting device, kind of like a big heavy mouse. So we asked this lady to make it to, to draw a circle. And what you see, is, so on the, over here, this is a planned view of the path of her circular movement. And as you can see, it's not very circular. But this is the first week in which this lady was able to actually make movement. So this is major progress. Over here is the speed profile along that path. And what you can see is that the path has corners in it. And the speed profile has bumps. And it speeds up, slows down, speeds up, slows down, speeds up, stops, goes on that way. So what you're seeing is that the movement is being made as a series of chunks, not necessarily one whole. So the mark movements are fragmented. Uh, over here, by the way, this is, we did the same thing. This is at week 11, if I recall correctly. This is again. The robot's just going along for the ride and recording movement. The patient is asked to draw a circle. The circle is still not perfectly circular, but it's a whole lot smoother. And notice that the speed profile now uh, took some fluctuations, but they're not stopping it. So what's going on is that the earliest movements appear to be sort of broken up. And you checked, this is work done with uh, the mono preps, and you took the first, the earliest movements made by the stroke, the stroke patients, extracted this, the uh, speed profiles, fit them to a, a, a function, we chose a beta function, and that's just for convenience. And check, and what you find is that over 19, we, we studied 20 patients, one of them didn't, got, got no recovery at all. Of the 19 that did recover, we had a very wide range of lesions, and yet all of the submovement profiles were within plus or minus 10% of all subjects. So the speed, the profile of the pilots does not vary with the lesion. There's a long story about what does vary with the bottom line is that the composition of the fragments changes with the color. This is, what, this is a, a study in which we looked at both. Uh, inpatients and community, community dwelling people, not patients, but really community dwelling participants. And uh, what you find is that the, in the early, the early on in the stroke, in, in, in the, the therapy process, what you're seeing is that the, the thick, heavy line is the actual movement measured. The little uh, light lines are stereotype profile submovements that we fit to that using an algorithm that I won't go into. But what you see is that early on, there's lots and lots of little movements and, not, and, not, and lots of irregularity. On the last therapy day, you see that there's still some irregularity, but there's a the uh, movements a whole lot smoother. And basically, what we found is that as the patients recovered, they, they used fewer sub movements. Each of the sub movements was longer in duration, higher in peak velocity, and they blended more together. And this looks at least qualitatively similar to the patterns that have been reported for infant lesion. So it looks like there's some learning style process going on. So basically, early recovery movements are fragmented. The fragments have stereotype speed profiles. The shape is in insensitive to the adhesion territory, and the composition correlates with recovery. OK, this is interesting. But I want to make the important point that we're not just talking about motion. We're talking about physical interaction. And I would love to divert into a detailed discussion of this. Well, that pleasure. 
the thing, the important thing here is that motion and interaction are in different domains. So controlling motion is essentially a problem in information processing. And the only constraints that, that are on your controller in that case are temporal causality, that is you can't have an output before the input, and boundaries. You have to make sure that nothing is in the Okay, well now you look at physical interaction, and now I again have causality and boundedness as constraint, but I also have a whole bunch of additional constraints, like energy has to be conserved, energy has to be reduced. If you're in the electrical domain, charge has to be conserved, and on and on. So you've got more constraints in the interactive domain than in the signal processing and information domain. So what you do, I'm recommending that what you do is that you represent the combination using a, a Sort of a repurposing of the classical equivalent electric circuit. If you know what equivalent electric circuit is, great, you understand this. If you don't, don't worry, don't be in there. So the idea here is to say, look, I'm going to combine the dynamic primitives in. This is a sort of a block diagram. I've got over here, I've got an interactive component with its interactive dynamics, but I've also got a forward pattern component with its dynamics, and those two are not necessarily the same. But both of these operators could be modified. Essentially, this is like a, an extension of the classical equivalent circuit to nonlinear systems, and uh, it may, it may uh, turn out to be a sort of new classical approach to the train. So, uh, as I said, I can go into, the, into lots of detail here, but I don't think I have the time for that. But I thought I would show you some of the stuff we've done on uh, applying this to robots. This is not in the therapy context, this is just to see how well does the idea work. I have to warn you that there's some explicit material coming up and some form of uh, equations. It's better only than that. The key thing to, to realize is that mechanical impedances, that is, the operators that take motion as an input will be forces and output. They can be nonlinear, but they superimpose linearly, their forces superimpose even if the elements are nonlinear. So basically, what's going on is the inertial, the, the, the robot mechanism is an inertial object, it's high dimensional, but so what? And it adds up all the forces applied to it, no matter where they came from, no matter where they were, they were How do we use that? Well, here's an example. We take, for example, I suppose I have a desired endpoint system that's written here. Uh, I can, that, that operator can be nonlinear, which I, for example, might want to do if I want to saturate the uh, use a saturation operator to reinforce. Generalizing to a dynamic impedance is easy enough, I don't have to spend time on that. Okay, I take that, and if I move, if I move on to the link, linkage kinematics with it, so if I know what the linkage kinematics were, then I can simply take the linkage kinematics and take configuration space, map it to endpoint space, take the derivative, get the Jacobian map rather than the map force to, to join torques. And this is now a control law that says if I have a reasonably good control of the torques, then I have a computer, computable control law, and you'll notice that I have no inverse kinematics in here, so this works even when there's singularities. By the way, that's really important. Because humans use singularities all the time and robots do not. Not that they can't do it, but we technically uh, uh, avoid singularities, and we shouldn't. On the other hand, there's a problem in that, well, of course, this is great, but if you have more degrees of freedom in the robot uh, configuration space than you have in the endpoint space, this controller says nothing about those extra degrees of freedom. Okay, well, what about using redundancy, the controlling redundancy by establishing a stiffness in the configuration space? So here, this is a different impedance that says joint torque is proportional to deviation from the not some nominal posture. So again, I can generalize the dynamic impedance. The only constraint I want here is that this stiffness matrix should be positive definite. It doesn't have to be big, it just has to not be zero. Then I combine the controls by adding them up. I add up the two controls. This is the endpoint, this is the joint. And again, you'll see that I don't have to invert kinematics. This works at similarities. And the other, thing, other interesting thing which I'll come back to is that notice that this choice of K imposes what's uh, emotion synergy. And what we're saying is that as you move the hand, the hand around, the joint space stiffness determines what combination of joint motions go along with that. How well, does it work? There's an advantage to this, and that is the whole idea is to be able to compose behaviors from adamant modules. So I can extend this to two or more arms, and most of these things we haven't got there yet, but we're working on it. So basically I say, look, I, have a, I, take, the, I take the net endpoint stiffness of the left arm, the right arm, the joint space stiffness of the left arm, the right arm, and I just add them up. And I think that that may facilitate parallel computation, we haven't got there yet either. 
But again, the key thing is I don't need to invert kinematics. That means I don't need to invert closed chain kinematics. So I can do this kind of thing. I don't have to worry about it. So essentially, this compositionality approach lets it scale up to higher degrees of freedom. And it does work. This is a, this is a demo where we took Baxter and had Baxter shine shoes. Essentially, the idea is to have Baxter pick up a flexible object. It's called Baxter then stretches it to the top of the cloth. Then it reduces his, his vertical impedance and pushes downwards. So you go from contact to from non contact to contact. And then you superimpose the motion. And you can have the machine perform this uh, fairly complex task. Now, this is all hand coded, so I'm not trying to say that this is an automatic. This is a, a, a viable way to program robots yet. But the key thing is that. We're able to handle flexible objects, multi arm coordination, contact and non contact, it all fits within this with that essentially seems. Well, you'll notice that I mentioned that the uh, that joint stiffness determines the coordination pattern. So the, the stiffness that I assume in the joint coordinates determines how, the, how those uh, joint angles are, are coordinated up for all possible movements. Why might that be relevant to neural recovery? Well, if you think about it, what I'm saying is that muscle tone, that's the level of activity of muscles, that determines the muscle stiffness and the joint stiffness. And by this theory, joint stiffness then determines joint coordination. Well, one of the common problems for people recovering after neurological injury is that they have abnormal muscle tone, which then could lead to abnormal stiffness, which then could lead to abnormal coordination. And that's one of the things that the therapists spend a whole lot of time trying to work on, that is, patients often come with. Uh, what they call that syndrome. For example, with stroke, stroke patients, they have a really hard time doing this kind of thing. So this sort of movement, not too bad, but what they call the scaption action is very hard. Possibly this is the way this is because of, uh, of the abnormal stiffness. Well, if this story is true, then this implies that if the joint space stiffness determines coordinated synergies, then observing coordination should allow you to determine stiffness. But there's a subtlety here. There's a, a stiffness. Fundamentally, you have to touch, you have to contact things to be able to measure stiffness. You can't do it just by looking. But if humans are able to guess the control system, then they may be able to determine stiffness just by observing motion. And this is an experiment that one of my postdocs did recently. So subjects sat in front of a laptop and saw a little tooling thing that moved on a screen. They uh, looked at it for a period for 20 seconds and they were asked to, to say, you say how stiff the system And you rate the stiffness on a life rate scale uh, zero to seven. The important thing is subjects didn't know how the motions were being generated. Here's the details of what they, what they saw. Essentially, there was a, the, the simulation that asked for a circular hand path, so the end point motion, but there was a joint space stiffness as well. And as you crank up the joint stiffness, you distort the path. But they, the subjects didn't know that. All they saw was this um, two link thing moving around. So the subjects only saw them moving then. They didn't see these paths, but this is in fact what they were exposed to. And we looked at variations of the elbow stiffness with the zero joint, the shoulder stiffness with zero elbow, both together. And the surprising thing was that subjects were remarkably good at uh, estimating students. So even like the standard computer screen, looking at this little stick figure that's moving around, and said, well, tell me how stiff it is. And then they said, what do you mean how stiff it is? Well, you know, how stiff it is. What do you mean stiff it is? Well, stiff it is, gives the range name of stiffness is a response of, we did basically didn't tell them what we looked for. And yet they were able to estimate stiffness extremely well. And the other thing that's interesting is the black, uh, the, the, the black background there is one of our subjects who happened to be a highly skilled, highly trained physical therapist. And she was just, had tears all over us. She, she, if you look at her R squared 0.95, she didn't even get this. So that suggests that this relation between stiffness and synergy may actually be, a, may actually reflect something about how humans do. So, Every summary in the mechanical is a semantic primitive that controls physical interaction. Compositionality of impedances enables modular control of complex tasks. 
It implies that coordinated synergies emerge from neuromuscular stiffness and appears to underlie the ability to rest in the bed normal stiffness from motion alone. So, I think this is at least a start. But uh, I'm an engineer, so I was told, told about uh, Murphy, Murphy's Law, Murphy's Laws. And that remember that Murphy was an optimist. So there's no free lunch. You don't get something for nothing. So here, the idea is that humans probably use something like dynamic primitives to overcome their major limitations, that is, that they're, that they're slow. And the dynamic primitives may afford performance advantages in some aspects of the control. Also, implied performance limitations. And we looked at that. So, one of the limitations is that uh, each of these primitive elements has its preferred time scales. So, you can't go infinitely fast, but you also can't go infinitely slow. Oscillations, for example, if I do something like this, that sounds like a rhythm. But if I separate those events by, say, five to ten seconds, I would go, okay, this is part of rhythm. And it is, trust me, and this is part of rhythm. But that doesn't sound rhythm, right? because it's too long. So, what we did, we asked subjects, this is another one of my former students, we asked subjects to make simple reaching movements back and forth in a plane between two fairly large targets that were presented visually. So this is not a terribly challenging task. You're just supposed to move smoothly, don't stop, but stay in time with the metronome. So the idea is keep moving. So you start the metronome off at a one second period, slow it down to six seconds. So we get to the point where they we're asking them to make six seconds to make this movement back and forth which is really slow, and they were supposed to move smoothly, don't stop, and stay in time with the metronome. They were able to do it. This is one subject's data, this is the average of all subjects, so subjects were able to manage this task. But what they weren't able to do was not stop. So they, as they slowed down, they introduced significant dwell periods, that is, the periods where they stopped. And again, this is one subject, this is the average of all the subjects. So the, they, they couldn't not stop, and the dwell time increased as, the, as they slowed down. Here you can see what's going on. The, the green lines are the actual um, the speed profiles. This is during the early, the early part, the, the one second period. This is during the transition, just through the six second period. What you can see is that the velocity is getting a whole lot more irregular as they slow down. Here we try to fit sinusoids, and the sinusoidal fit does well when they're uh, at the one second period, but it does terrible later on. Here we fit some movements to it, and this is a multiple from the algorithm. But basically, what you find is that as they slow down, the uh, some movements, the, the movement itself is fit to these support mounted non normal shapes, which I can tell you about if you want. What you find is that as they slow down, the number of some movements increases. And so they get <laughs> something on the order of five to seven sub movements per second. Per second. So the bottom line is. What's going on here is we've asked them to make rhythmic behavior. And rhythmic behavior is that's one of the things that we do easily. I wave my hands and I talk. But not if you ask them to go slow. If you ask them to go slow, the rhythm breaks down, and I have to wind up sort of trying to construct the behavior from these sub movements. And the sub movements themselves have limited parameters. For example, there's a refractory period. I should be careful. There appears to be a refractory period. It says once I've lost a sub movement, I've got to wait for around about 100 milliseconds before I can launch the next one. Is also a bit of a progression. So basically, the bottom line is moving slowly is hard for humans. Right? You probably knew that. But that's actually not part of your mechanics. There's no mechanical reason why we can't move slowly. It's part of the process of self -reputation. Okay, well, if rhythmic movements are hard for humans, if slow movements are hard for humans, maybe we should increase the pace of treatment and you know, look at rhythmic motion therapy, right? Why not? Possible advantages that now you get a high dosage of movement, you get lots more moves for you in the therapy time, so this would make good sense. But you've got to check, you've got to understand the basics of human movement control, and would it work? So, the short answer is that rhythmic and discrete actions appear to be different primitive elements of multiple mode behavior. You might think that rhythmic actions are sort of a sequence of discrete actions, so this is actually a, 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 a rhythm is a Fourth and back and forth and back movement. Turns out that's not the case because if you look at uh, these are some studies done by Dag um, and Stefan Schell. I don't know how well you can see this, but there's sort of orangish regions and yellowish regions. 
And the, the yellowish regions are the parts of the brain that are active when you're just doing rhythmic movements, either wrist or wrist and motion. The orangish regions are the that places that are active when you do discrete wrist movements. And basically, you use a whole lot more brain when you're in that form uh, making discrete movements than in, in rhythmic movements. There's a little bit of overlap, but not a whole lot. They're essentially distinct brain movements. And the rhythmic movement is more fundamental. It involves more of a deep brain. There's another interesting thing, and this is when you look at the transfer of learning. Now, this slide is terrible, and I'm sure nobody's going to read that much text in the available time. But the basic idea was subjects made these horizontal plane reaching movements. It's actually what we would call it a, 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 it's, it's an out and back movement with the hand looking at a cursor on, on a screen. Then, after some practice of doing that, the screen is this, this, the screen is remapped so that my out and back movement this way makes the screen not go up and down, but up on one side. In this case, the screen went that way. So then subjects were exposed to that uh, uh, visual perturbation, and it's been known for quite some time that when you expose subjects to this per uh, visual perturbation, they rapidly learn how, how to compensate for it, and they do it uh, apparently spontaneously. So here's what happened. First of all, on the top row here, you see the, the the, the, there was a baseline set of movements. We started off with discrete. Discrete was move out and back and stop. Move out and back and stop. Rhythmic was move out and back continuously. Baseline started with discrete and then, and, and then continued into, into, into rhythmic, and both of those were provided. Then the uh, visual distortion was applied, and on the first trial, as you see, the subjects, the, this is the motion of the, of the cursor on the screen, and of course, it's not in the right direction. But over a relatively modest number of trials, subjects learn to correct that and make the appropriate movement to get a straight line vertical movement on the screen. Then, with the same distortion applied, subjects are asked to make the same movement uh, uh, rhythmically, and of course, they were able to manage to keep the cursor going straight. The interesting thing is when you look at the opposite, uh, which is on, on the bottom row, where subjects were initially given rhythmic exposure and then, then, then uh, discrete exposure. This is in the baseline case. And the distortion is applied. And as before, you see that initially they, they make an error that is the first cycle goes in the wrong direction. The last cycle, uh, they, by the last cycle, of the rhythmic uh, performance has improved. Now you ask them to do the same thing discreetly, and move out and back and stop. And they don't transfer. So they, they, they have, they recover the error they had at the beginning of the exposure. And of course, the further exposure, they, they do learn how to uh, compensate. But the rhythmic exposure doesn't transfer to discrete execution. And again, this is a terribly busy slide. But the key thing I want you to see is this is discrete first, then rhythmic. And you see that the, the advance of the, or the, what they learn during the, the discrete exposure transfers. This is rhythmic first, then discrete. First of all, you'll notice that the rhythmic learning is a whole lot slower and it doesn't transfer. So basically what's going on is that uh, discrete, uh, learning something through discrete movements will transfer to rhythmic execution. Learning something through rhythmic execution will not necessarily transfer to discrete execution. And if you think about it, that might have something to do with one of the reasons why we've had difficulty with um, training people to recover locomotion after a stroke. Because if you go to the rhythmic behavior, well, of course, locomotion is fundamentally rhythmic, but there's other parts of locomotion which are essentially, for example, standing up, being able to take a step. That's actually a discrete action. So maybe we've actually targeted the wrong thing for the, for the motor training. And that blank screen is to have you look at my time available. Uh, so let me show you one more. Uh, and, and, and wrap it up. So, I'm interested in moving towards um, more functional tasks, and of course, that's I think important because while we, we can learn a lot from simple point to point reaching, and a lot of the, uh, work in the neuroscience has focused on this, but functional tasks almost always involve contact and physical interaction. And for physical interaction, you've got to think in terms of the neuromuscular mechanical piece that is, the response of the limb to perturbations. So we looked at this in the context of uh, controlling uh, arm prosthesis. This is very old work, I apologize for that, but I think it's worth, it's worth looking at. So this is an arm prosthesis and that, that is, this is for um, the upper limb am amputation. What we're looking at here is an elbow prosthesis. We didn't uh, work on the 
uh, controlling device. The key thing to notice, however, is that controlling interaction is essential because you've got to manage the interaction between the machine and the human, which does that for the human, and interaction between the machine and the outside world. And what, what, what we took advantage of here is we know from studies that uh, humans can control the effect of mechanical impedance of the muscles and the limbs, and we implemented a, a controller that sort of did a crude mimic of that, basically took the electrical activity of biceps and triceps residual, takes that magnitude signal, uses the difference of those signals to, to determine the motion of the elbow and the sum of those signals to increase the effect of the impedance. And uh, this is a crude mimic of natural muscle behavior. <coughs> Let me see what this is like. Controller B, slow speed, second round. <clears throat> so we chose this particular test because it requires coordination of natural and artificial limbs and interacting with the kinematic strength of the environment, which is not trivial. But as you can see, I have this is Ryan Mathis. By the way, this is, B, high speed. this is a mistake because on several occasions Brian went fast enough to break the hardware. <laughs> no friction, no weight. not just talking about motion primitives, but also physical interaction primitives. They may also account for aspects of recovery, that is, the discoordination of the other's recovery movements, which tend to be fragmented, the abnormal coordinative synergies, which may be due to having abnormal stiffness, and although I didn't get into it, they may also even account for the plateaus in recovery that we see. So I would argue that although this is, I, I don't claim this is a complete theory, but I think it's a place to start, and there is some uh, experimental evidence to uh, back it up. So let me stop at this point and thank you for your attention. Questions if you want. Questions for uh over? So you can have a point I can have a question. Questions? So how are you? Very good, good morning. But, so, Neville, that's a great talk, and uh, you made a great case over the years about stiffness and impedance control and so on. So, can I talk, ask questions a bit outside of your presentation? You know, lately, soft robotics is getting kind of popular, fashionable. And how is this, uh, this your idea is going to work when, in a sense, we are going, I think, maybe going opposite direction in terms of the whole impedance control, stiffness, and all of that? Or is there going to be a good mechanical model for that approach? 
So I would argue that all of the soft robotic devices have fundamentally have variable input impedances. Right? So you take, for example, some of the inflatable, the pneumatic inflatable actuators. It's one of the, one of the approaches to soft robotics. Those things, and you pressurize them, they not only change movement, uh, change their position or configuration, change the forces they can exert, but they get stuck. Look at that means they must be continually adaptive to that uh, in a dynamic sort of way, right? Fine. Otherwise, the, the traditional ones are you really are controlling. Otherwise, they have the instead. Well, so let's be careful about what I mean by control. If you have, a, if you give me an input, a knob that I can turn, that changes the dynamic response in some way, that's what I need. The other thing that's nice about the soft robotics is that they're intrinsically low impedance devices, not high impedance devices. I think that's in fact, that, that, that's good news and bad news. The good news is that's, that's exactly what one muscles do. Muscles are fundamentally low impedance devices. As a result of that, we're not that great at moving slowly, and we're not that great at being very accurate training. So draw a straight line. Compare that with how well you'll draw a straight line with, with a robot. Draw a circle. I won't be able to do it. There's an apocryphal tale about it. Ah. I think it was Michelangelo when he was being commissioned to uh, paint the Sistine Chapel, the Pope, whose name I forget, asked him to send an example of his work. And apparently what he sent back was a canvas with a circle on it, which he had drawn freehand. So he was good, we're well, not that good. My point is that I think that the soft robotics, at least the ones that I'm aware of, are fundamentally doing what I'm talking about. And if you try to take soft robotics and use them in conjunction with stuff that has inertia, you're going to take advantage of the fact that the impedance is so limited, even with the long way. So I'd say that this is part of the same uh, approach. Sorry. I do have a follow up question to that, I'm all from, by the way. Um, I mean, and it's pretty amazing what is going on there, and particularly also like soft robotics, I think, is an interesting area to look into. But how does this, how does the traditional control methods apply to such type of robots? What is your view? Like, is this going to be like a traditional way of solving differential equations, coming up with optimal controllers, things like that? Or how are we going to to control them? Okay, so I think that so, so I wouldn't give up on, on traditional control just yet. I think that there's a lot of really powerful theory that's been developed. However, I think when you get to things which have the, the complexity of, for example, a whip. So how are you going to do that with the traditional control? I think there, this is something we're presently studying, we have people in the lab cracking whips and measuring. I think what happens there is that if you can find the primitive dynamic action that encompasses what, what, you, want to, what, what you want to achieve, you don't need a detailed model of the object that, that, that you're working with. So in fact, we've, so far we've only done some simulation studies and some initial experimental work, but we've taken a model of a whip with huge number of degrees of freedom, and we've assumed that, and we've got a model of a human, we've assumed that the human can only generate these primitive stereotypes of movements. Move from one pose to another with the stereotypes of speed profile. Is that sufficient to be able to target the whip to a, a location that's just at the, at the limit of the of length of the whip? We, we uh, approach that as an optimization problem, which is quite good to, to do the model we need to control, except now we don't have a model of the object itself, we just say, here's a bunch of parameters of what you can do. It turns out to converge. It turns out to converge quite quickly. So I think that when you go to soft robotics, I don't think detailed partial differential equation models of the soft robots are going to be useful. But if you tell me the kind of primitive behaviors that they can produce, for example, what does my air actuator do when I change the pressure from, from A to B and, and I just leave it alone? Well, there's a time course of, of uh, both motion and force and impedance that follows from that. Give you that information, parameterize that, and now use that as the basis of your model to control. So I, I, I'm not sure I would give up on traditional control, but I think you can extend the methods. So optimization methods are still very powerful. So state observation is still going to be important. I think detailed models, maybe that's all. Um, I have a good question. So, um, given that we are at the Do Good Robotics Symposium, um, can you talk a little bit about how these technologies, if and when they will become commonplace, and some of the obstacles along the way, roadblocks, if you will, including cost and 
approval devices, FDA, all that stuff? Okay, that's a hard question. Uh, so, let's see. Uh, in terms of machines to provide uh, assistance with recovery, I think they are slowly making their way into uh, the, the, the slow starting to penetrate. The hard, so the, the hard problems are, it's actually, uh, the hard, it's an FDA approval, that was trivial. Right? It essentially, these are exercise machines. That was, that was, a, that was a, a no brainer. Um, uh, clinical studies are really, they're really important and really difficult. And part of the problem is that humans are so variable. It's really, really hard to, to uh, properly control an experiment, a clinical experiment. And the other thing, which I think is a barrier, is clinical experiments take time. And it takes years to get 20, 30 patients worth of, worth of data. Life is too short for that. And I, don't, I don't have the time for that. The other big problem is uh, making money. If nobody makes a buck, that was going to happen. Right? So making the transition from technology that works in the lab and maybe even works in a clinical trial all the way out to something that makes money when it's used routinely, that's hard. But it's not impossible. And I think that one of the one of the saving graces there is, particularly in the area of stroke, but it's true in other areas too, but with stroke the problem is so big that even if we only make a teeny tiny dent on a problem that's got billions of dollars worth of cost associated with it and it's going to grow, I think it's going to happen. But I think you have to make, so uh, this is personal philosophy that may, may be wrong, but my sense is that you've got to get the sequence right. So if you make it cheap and it doesn't work, you're dead. You're not going to go back. You make it work, but it's not yet cheap. Okay, well, but we've been there. That's what a lot of technology does. You make it work first, and then you work on ways to make it cheaper and more reliable, and maybe lighter and so forth. And if you look at the first aircraft, yeah, they were like, you know, it was astonishing people who got into them at all. But now, with time, they become more robust, more reliable, more powerful, and so forth. I think some of the things are going to happen with technology that's interacting with people. You've got to make it so that it's going to be able to respond properly to, to the human, that is, get out of the way when it needs to. It's going to be safe. We've so far, I should think, we've maintained a 100% safety record. And it's going to be effective. You're going to have, it, it's going to work, or you're not going to get anything for it. And of course, that's, that's proving that it's hard. How can robots make use of similarity like humans do? Well, first of all, so does everybody get one of my different similarities? So, for example, when I walk around, I'm, st I'm standing in a single configuration, right? Look at the robots, and you'll see like H1B. Well, first of all, why should we? Well, we do this because it's less tiring. How do you do it? Make a controller that doesn't care about similarity. Not only can operate similarities, but they're doing easily. We've shown, uh, uh, I don't think we have to We took that two arm back circuit, both of the two arms together, we were able to get it all the way out of here and seamlessly put that back. So basically, you design the controller so that it doesn't need to be personally work in that. You can do that. And it works. So I think it can be done, and it's worth doing. Thank you.